To be brave is to behave bravely when your heart is faint. So you can be brave only when you really ain't. So high time. There's a lot of brave people in this room, and we're remembering a lot of brave people tonight. <clears throat> there are the scientists who said, I have my truth, and I question yours. <clears throat> and they knew that their careers were on the line. There are the mothers who had the life of their babies on the line. There are the gay men who said, the rest of you might believe this, but I don't. And there were the Africans who said, beware of white men bearing money. <laughs> <laughs> and there were icons like Christine Majori. And I, I think that little poem I read, and I prefer poems that are only four lines long, because it's the only ones I can remember. How did she feel as an HIV positive mother? about her children, her husband, herself, and all the people who relied on her. I'm sure at many times she felt, as in the poem, very scared inside, but she was always there for us. There are the journalists who put their careers on the line, and some of those are here tonight. It's a sure way to end your career as a journalist in many countries. <laughs> And uh, that's another form of bravery. And then the flip side of bravery, bravery, of course, is cowardice. And we see people like Luc Montagne saying one thing to, to one group of people and a totally different thing to other people, depending on how it affects his career, his status, his position in the world. We see people like Joseph Sonnabend who asked questions, but when the pressure got too, too high, he stopped asking the question. He still questions things, but only in private. And you can only draw it out of him in private. Um, so I would now, is our city and David Rasnick here? I'd like them both to come up for just a brief second. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to give you two a hug <laughs> for two reasons. First, first of all, they are my right-hand woman and my left-hand man on the organization of this conference. They've done the most of the work. But secondly, we're going to play a little game. I, I used to be a Boy Scout leader, and I had learned you never start a meeting without a game because people misbehave if they don't have little game. So the rules of this game are that you can only be hugged if you've already been hugged, and when you're hugged, you stand up if possible, or you know, if it's for some people it's not, that's fine. And then we'll see how quickly it takes for the whole room to be standing. This is an illustration of exponential growth, which is important. So you, us three have been hugged, so we now have to find people to hug, and then as soon as you're hugged, you go find somebody else to hug, and we keep going until everybody in the room has had a hug. <laughs> 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 okay, stand up. I'm still here. I've always wanted to say that. I'm not being a minister too hard. I, I hope a couple of things we can learn from uh, exponential growth is that our movement could grow like this. If we all touched another person and keep touching and those people go and send the questions, the messages that we have uh, around the world. It's the only way this organization is going to grow. It's not really an organization as much as a movement which this organization, Rethinking AIDS, is a very small part of, but a critical uh, part of. 
The second thing, it made me think about what if there was an HIV? And what if you were infected with one particle today and this slow virus dis it divided once a day, which is very slow for something microscopic? How many particles would you have at the end of a month? Well, I'm sure you all know that 2 to the power of 30 is approximately a billion. You can get out your calculators if you want to check this. Now, a billion particles of 100 nanometers isn't really that much. You probably couldn't even see it. But what about after the second month? <laughs> well, you would now have, according to my calculations, four liters of HIV. So how can you have a slow virus when even at this slow period of growth, you end up with this massive quantity after only two months? There's actually a Chinese uh, uh, story about this, about the, the king who this, this peasant did something for him, and he said, you can have any, everything you want. And of course, in most fairy tales, the, the young lad said, I want your daughter as my wife. <laughs> Always seems to be the answer. He said, no, no, anything but that. So he, he asked for a grain of rice, and then he said, every day I want you to give me double. So at first it's fine, one grain, two grain, four grains. But at the end of 30 days, uh, that's a billion grains. Pretty soon he had the entire kingdom and <laughs> the king's daughter as his wife. Um, I was, uh, just if you'll be, uh, I forgot to bring up to the stage everything that I need. So uh, I travel a lot in my business, as some of you know. I've, I've met uh, other dissidents in Korea and India and all around the world. As I travel on business, I try to uh, uh, mix a little AIDS rethinking with my business. So I had this opportunity to go undercover into a, a new drug facility, and I found out about this new drug that they're producing. It's called GZP, and I know you've not heard about it. It's, they have this, this slogan for this drug. Well, first of all, I had to go undercover. I needed a false name, so I used the name Joseph Newton. Some of you, <laughs> may, some of you may realize the irony. I was thinking of Joseph Stalin, but I thought that might be a little <laughs> too obvious. So I, I went in and they, they, they showed me this demonstration of this, this new drug. And their slogan of this drug is, we put the nuke back in nuke. And uh, they said that, that one pill can eliminate HIV in a 10 square mile radius. Not only, <laughs> not only <laughs> in the HIV positives, but in everybody else who might be silently HIV positive. And so I was able to get a pill, one pill, without the active ingredient. And uh, you know, they, they've rammed a lot of things down our throats, so I need a volunteer for this pill. A any volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the active ingredient is uh, plutonium. <laughs> And that's, that's why it's very good in rural areas because actually you, you can't take the pill unless you live at least 100 miles away from the hospital where the doctors are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there, to me, it seems like there are four currents in our, in our struggle. There is the purity of science. Maybe purity is not quite the right word. The integrity of science, which is being corrupted by the AIDS establishment. And that's one really, really important um, factor that goes far beyond just HIV and AIDS. I think HIV and AIDS is just the worst manifestation of the corruption of science. Then there is the issue of human rights, the, the people who are in jail uh, who've lost their kids. That's the second leg. Two other legs are, of course, the media, the media that's silent, the media that suppresses the media that eliminates people who ask questions. And I think the fourth leg is the legal leg, the, the attacks on, on uh, people who are HIV positive, um, our attempts to right the wrongs of the past to people who've been injured by drugs, um, uh, people who have suffered greatly from the HIV theory. And uh, so when we were discussing who was going to be the keynote speaker, we wanted a fresh voice, one that you might not have heard before. And it seemed that somebody could address the issues of both journalism and what Michael Tracy calls the injustice system, 